In a world where gods and demons clashed over a century ago when the demon king Wo Sun launched an attack, he led an army of creatures with the goal of invading the realm of the gods, triggering the great war between gods and demons. In the midst of this conflict, the god of war Shu Tian, guardian of the Western Temple, fought alone against the entire army, defeating a large number of them. However, as the war seemed to tilt in favor of the gods due to Shu Tian's brave efforts, the god of war was betrayed by a celestial demon. The latter attacked him from behind, ending his life. Shu Tian's spirit split into 72 pieces, dispersing throughout the mortal world. This division caused the war to completely tilt in favor of the demons. Faced with this situation, the god Shijia had no choice but to use all his power to seal both gods and demons in the void of the Western Temple. Now, only with the power of the god of war Shu Tian can the seal of the void be opened and the gods saved, thus restoring balance in Buddhist teachings. Currently, we contemplate a desert landscape. Among the mountains, a small wooden house with a thatched roof stands out. Inside, two children, Xiao Sheng and his older brother Yuan Zhen, are frightened due to the tremors that have started. Yuan Zhen reassures his younger brother, assuring him that their father will protect them. As the tremors intensify, Yuan Zhen places his brother inside a basket, carries it like a backpack, and runs out of the cabin. Meanwhile, a man with a staff confronts a demon wielding a chain with a gigantic rock at the end as a weapon. Despite the fierce fight, the demon strikes the man, crashing him against a mountain. Observing the situation, Yuan, armed with two wooden swords, decides to help his father. Just at that moment, the demon attempts to strike Yuan, but the father reacts quickly and blocks the attack with his staff. With a quick motion, the father gently sends his two sons to a safe place at the top of another mountain. Meanwhile, the battle continues, and the demon executes a powerful blow that kneels the man. He transforms his staff into nunchucks, wraps them around the demon's arm, and after making it lose balance, delivers a knee to the face. He tries to strangle the demon with the chains, but due to the monster's enormous strength, they break, sending the man flying. Reactivating, the man kicks the pieces of his weapon, turning them into projectiles. Then, he casts a spell surrounding the demon with the fragments and prays for the sky and earth to join him in defeating the demon. A mysterious electric energy emanates from the pieces of the broken weapon, trapping the monster's arms and neck. After closing his fist, the surrounding mountains form a hand that closes over the demon, trapping it under a pile of rocks. The father gathers with his children and asks them to run. He explains to Yuan that it is a demon that hunts demon hunters and goes by the name Asura. After moving away from the area, they arrive at a place resembling a gigantic tree, whose branches form paths. Upon arrival, they must descend into a strange cave that leads to an underground temple. The man releases a kind of seal, opening the celestial door of the Imperial Palace. At that moment, roots withdraw from the area, revealing two swords stuck in a kind of monument. The father asks Yuan to take one of the swords. Both remove the swords, which begin to glow as they are taken from the pedestal, opening the ground in front of them and revealing a small golden box. The father tells Yuan that inside, there is something important that he must deliver to his younger brother in the future, as that object is Xiao Sheng's destiny. Then, the father hands him the other sword and tells him that they are demon hunter swords, passed down from generation to generation. Although he may not feel worthy of them at the moment, the man reassures Yuan, telling him that he has trained him with the sword since he was a child, hoping that he will become the owner of those swords. He trusts that he will be the best demon hunter chosen by the heavens. The place begins to shake. The demon has been unleashed. Father and sons decide to run through a tunnel. They reach a bridge over a lava lake, which turns out to be the tomb of the ancient demon hunters. At that moment, the demon suddenly appears through the ceiling and strikes the hunter forcefully. However, he performs an incantation, throwing strange sheets of light at it. Subsequently, he casts another spell that causes plates to surround the demon, enclosing it in a sphere and sealing it in lava. To the relief of the children, when the smoke disappears, the warrior is safe. After the sound of a bell, a female hand pierces through the man's chest. He is surprised not to understand how she penetrated the barrier, but she reveals that she was inside from the beginning. He simply couldn't perceive her. The man falls to his knees, looks at his children, and decides to spend his last breath saving them. 
He asks Yuan Zhen to protect his brother and casts a final spell that creates light boards around the children, forming a magical barrier. His intention is to send them to safety, but at that moment, the demon girl asserts that they will not escape and attacks the barrier, causing a cut on the boy's cheek. Despite her failed attempt to kill them, the spell achieves its goal. To the joy of their father, with his last breath, he manages to save his children and entrust them with the mission of saving the world. Several years have passed, and we can see the brothers who have grown up. They encounter a young monk who pretends to be a demon hunter, but is actually a con man. The monk and a lizard demon have been tricking the villagers for money. The brothers discover the truth, confront the monk and decide to teach him a lesson. They tie him up, dress him as a lizard demon, and leave him with a severed reptilian tail that appears to move on the ground, exposing his fraudulent activities. In the morning, we observe that both brothers carry out a kind of ceremony to officially make Sheng a man, as he has reached the age of 14. Through a special ritual, his older brother sprinkles golden powder over him, causing one of the talismans to start surrounding him to impart the power to eradicate evil, thus marking his transformation into a demon hunter. After a brief conversation in which the new hunter expresses disbelief at deserving such a title and power, his brother reveals that their father left him in his care and sacrificed himself to protect him from an extremely wicked demon. Subsequently, he hands over what their father bequeathed to him, and upon opening the box, Sheng finds only a small metallic object with some engraved details. When he asks his brother about the nature of this object, he responds that he remembers their father telling him it was his destiny. Later, an elderly man arrives running in desperation, begging them for help for his village, as a sudden and mysterious fog has appeared, and those who enter it do not come out again. In the village, there are rumors that it's the work of a cat demon. So once again, the old man asks for their help with a bag of coins in hand. However, this doesn't seem to interest the two brothers, as they believe it could be a trick to deceive them. While ignoring the old man and pushing him aside, he drops the bag of coins to the ground, and a small bell rolls out. This catches Jen's attention, who begins to recall everything that happened in the past with the demon girl. As the old man picks up the coins from the ground, Jen tightly grabs his arm and asks where that bell came from. Finally, they decide to go to the village, where they observe an intense fog. As they enter the village, the brothers notice that the fog thickens as they progress. Unaware, they separate, and a female voice asks Jen whom he is seeking. He responds by inquiring about the origin of a bell and offers to let her live if she leaves the town. In response, the woman launches a burst of attacks towards Jen, who manages to dodge all of them. At that moment, she reveals herself as the assailant, a cat demon attempting to strike the demon hunter several times, finally scratching his back. Facing this, Jen focuses, ignoring the distractions, and executes a spinning tornado-like attack that disperses the surrounding fog. He knocks down the demon girl, who, frightened, begs him not to kill her, explaining that she only hunted birds for sustenance, and that the missing people have simply gotten lost. She tries to seduce him, but Jen questions her about the origin of the bell. She claims to have found it by chance, and is unaware of its origin. Deciding to spare the demon, she takes the opportunity to attack him from behind. Anticipating her intentions, Jen defeats her with a skillful sword move, and the demon disappears. Meanwhile, another cat demon confronts young Sheng, throwing him into the air and expressing disappointment upon discovering that the demon hunter is just a child. Enraged, Sheng picks up a stick from the ground and challenges the demon. Observing from a distance, his brother considers this fight as the final test before his graduation. The cat demon attacks repeatedly, but Sheng blocks each blow with his improvised weapon. The demon suggests that it is pointless to fight, as his sister has probably killed his older brother. However, Sheng is convinced that his brother will not lose. He manages to strike the creature several times, but it, enraged, increases its speed, inflicting cuts and breaking the stick with which the boy defended himself. Just before falling, Sheng sees the object his father gave him and takes it. The object begins to glow, emitting great power and extending into a magical staff. Sheng uses this new weapon as a spear, resonating a magical wave that captures the attention of various characters familiar with the legend of the God of War. The small iron stick has transformed into a golden staff that manages to pierce the cat demon. We observe that the demon cat is surprised by the connection Xiao Sheng has with the magical weapon, while the child lies severely injured. 
As the cat attempts to remove the magical staff embedded in its body, regardless of losing one of its nine lives, Yuan Zhen enters the scene, asking where the rattle comes from. When he makes it ring, the cat seems to enter a trance, and confesses that that person gave him the bell, assuring that by ringing it, Zhen and his brother Sheng will appear. Zhen asks again who that person is and where they are, and the demon begins to repeat the phrase, kill the demon hunter and get the spirit fragment. The rattle starts spinning at high speed and enters the demon's mouth, who seems to be increasing the size of its body. Finally, the cat explodes. After that scene, two peculiar beings seem to have been observing everything from the beyond. Turning attention back to our characters, Sheng appears to awaken, and the first thing he sees is his elder brother by his side. A few meters away, the magical weapon lay embedded in the ground, with no trace of the cat demon. As Sheng picks up the weapon, which seems to shrink in his hands, the idea lingers in Jen's mind that the cat had mentioned the spirit fragment. He wonders what connection this might have with his father's death. At that moment, in the distance, the figures of two characters emerge, one with a pig-faced visage and a handsome but peculiar knight. Sheng introduces these two suspects, stating that he and his brother are demon hunters who were hired to assist the village in eliminating the demon cat, Yuan Lai. The woman with the pig mask, with little interest in hearing the story of our protagonists, asks him to hand over the object in his hands. Despite having been injured by the explosion, Jen refuses to let his brother surrender the golden staff and retaliates by attacking with his swords. However, the attack is violently thwarted by the pig woman, who once again compels them to hand over the magical weapon. The boys respond that they won't give anything to the stupid pig, greatly infuriating the girl and prompting the young man who came with her to intervene and calm the situation. He says they don't want to harm them, and suddenly pulls out what would be like some sort of tablet, casting healing powers that mend all of Jen's internal injuries. Now then, once and for all, they present themselves. The lad is called Sha Luo, and she is Zhu Xiao Pa. Both are celestial messengers. They explain to our protagonists that the magical object the boy possesses is called the Divine Staff, and belongs to the god of war, Shu Tian. Later, Sha explains the story we heard in the first chapter. He confesses that with the divine weapon, they can perceive the traces of the spirit of this god. To revive him, they need to find the 72 fragments of his spirit scattered in the mortal world, and thus restore Buddhism. However, Sha reveals that the key to finding the fragments is the divine staff that belongs to Sheng. Jen deduces that if they give up the divine staff, they will miss out on finding that person mentioned by the demon cat. Therefore, he will do everything possible to avoid missing that great opportunity. Shaw explains to them that, according to the celestial book, whoever gathers the energy of heaven and earth can awaken the divine staff. Their presence does not go unnoticed, as not only the celestial messengers can perceive that energy, but also the demons. The army of the demon king Boshun will not stand idly by. Jen appears unconvinced by the story, irritating Ju. The girl asserts that there is no room for negotiations and that they are going to take the divine staff. Under the gaze of Sha Luo, Ju calms down and explains in detail that if the demons break the seal first and release their army before they revive the god of war, it will be the end. The boy decides to believe in this story, indicating that if he hands over the staff, peace will return to the six realms. Shang hands over the magical weapon. Although Jen thinks that without it they won't be able to find that person, he is happy for his brother, who won't be exposed to danger by carrying this particular object with him. The siblings withdraw from the place in search of the reward for saving the village, but Ju accuses them of forging the divine staff. It seems that when the object slips from the child's hands, it loses its golden color. They come to the conclusion that the staff has chosen Sheng as its new owner. With no other option and determined, the child will have to accompany these celestial messengers. The staff appears to guide the group towards the side of the mountains, initiating this great adventure. All aboard! Now the entire group is aboard the ship, Little White Dragon, crossing arid zones, and our protagonists seem to be eating as if there's no tomorrow. This irritates Ju, as we know she's the grumpy one in the group. At that precise moment, a warning alarm sounds in the ship, an obstacle in the way has triggered the safety brakes, shaking all the crew members inside. Jen decides to go out to investigate what it is and can see a woman on the ground a few meters away. He rushes to help her. 
Seeing her injured, he decides to take her to the little white dragon to treat her wounds. But Ju seems to be jealous of this beautiful woman, and questions why she was alone in the middle of nowhere. Now calmer inside the ship, and with the injuries being attended to, they decide to ask her what had happened. She tells them that she was walking, and some bandits tried to rob her, stabbing her in the process. She asks them to take her back to the Dark Canyon, as she fears encountering these bandits again. Our protagonists explain that they are precisely heading to that place in search of some fragments, and under the watchful gaze of the lady, Shah appears to interrupt Ju, saying that it's not the business of the strange lady, who, by the way, is called Ziju. Shah suggests resting that night and leaving early in the morning. While everyone was sleeping, in the room are Sheng, Jen, and Ziju. The latter wakes up and apparently with a strange alliance, tries to attract the divine staff. However, at that precise moment, Shah appears to interrupt her, coming out of the shower and confusing the room. In the morning, all the crew members wake up to have breakfast and continue the adventure. However, our young siblings receive the news that Miss Ziju had left early without notice, and that's not all. The Divine Staff had also disappeared. In another scene, we see Miss Ziju with the Divine Staff heading towards a cave. There, she reflects on the purpose of her mission and remembers that inside that cave, her sister Zi Yang is tied up. Ziju is surrounded by a group of bandits, and atop is their leader alongside his right-hand man. They propose to obtain the Divine Staff, which was in the hands of our protagonists, and in exchange, they will release her sister. This leader seems to possess one of the fragments of the spirit of the God of War. He explains that the Divine Staff is the most powerful weapon in the universe, and if he obtains it along with the power of the spirit of the God of War, all demons will obey him. This bandit promises that if she delivers the artifact on time, he will set her sister free. However, he warns that he cannot guarantee anything if she is late. Our group, wasting no time, heads to the spider cave where Shaw claims the staff is located along with the swindler. Meanwhile, inside the cave, Ziju hands over the artifact, and the leader, as promised, releases his younger sister. But just as they were about to leave, the right-hand man of the bandit chief blocks their path. While the leader laughs, he tells them that he had promised to let Zi Yang go, but not her, and that they had another surprise prepared. Ziju decides to respond to this deception by attacking the leader of these bandits to retrieve the divine staff. Just as she is about to be attacked by the right-hand man of the chief, Ziju invokes the divine staff, forcing the enemy to retreat. The girl is surprised to see that the divine staff does not respond, but without wasting time, she launches an attack on the enemy from her alliance and escapes with Zi Yang. These two bandits manage to recover and run after them. The girls try to defend themselves as best they can, but after an intense struggle, the right-hand man of the leader manages to trap them in a diamond barrier. Apparently, he also possesses spiritual abilities and manages to leave them with no way to escape. We can observe that Shaw confirms, upon checking his tablet, that the Divine Staff is inside the Spider Cave. However, he clarifies that even though it is inside, the most challenging part of the journey is the passages within this cave. Jun suggests splitting up and quickly heads with his younger brother in search of the staff. Despite the difficulties on the way, Sheng is confident in being able to find Ziju, thanks to the young girl's perfume. The two boys reach the place where Ziju and her sister were trapped, and Ziju asks them not to harm them, promising to do whatever they ask. Although Sheng seems to want to react to this abusive situation, his older brother asks him to wait, as it is not the right time yet. The big boss releases the girls from the diamond barrier, and when he is about to approach Zi Young, Ziju launches an attack that hits the enemy's face. This enrages the boss, who responds by attacking Ziju with all his power. However, her sister steps in the way of the attack, taking all the possible damage. In this situation, Jen and his brother launch an attack, but an explosion interrupts the fight. Finally, Sha and Xiao arrive. The latter directs a powerful attack towards Ziju, who is severely injured. Jen intervenes to prevent the impact, stating that Miss Ziju is innocent. Jen orders Ju to leave the place with her sister. While Sheng tries to help the two sisters, the enemy boss's right-hand man tries to launch an attack, but Jun intercepts him and warns him that if he takes one more step, he will end him using his two sabers. The leader of the bandits summons all his fighters to surround our protagonists. Xiao asks Sha to handle the situation, and he casts a spell called Wind Tornado, sending everyone flying out of the cave. 
The bandit leader reacts to prevent the sisters from escaping, launching an attack of rock spikes, but this attack proves futile thanks to the protection provided by Shah. Unsatisfied, the leader attacks again, but Jen intervenes with his sabers, halting the attack. The leader's right-hand man also tries to join the fight, to which Xiao Pa responds. Meanwhile, Sha casts a spell called Heavenly Thunder. The right-hand man tries to shield himself with his diamond barrier defense, but Xiao Pa reacts in time and throws him into the power cluster created by Sha, finally ordering the Heavenly Thunder to strike the bandit leader. The celestial messengers request that they leave everything in their hands as the guys safely escort the sisters, and Ziju apologizes for deceiving them, returning the celestial staff. The leader of the bandit seems unwilling to give up, and launches a strike against Sha, who dodges it, and counterattacks by sending a red flame attack. The leader forms a rock shield, and Sha Luo's attack appears to be heading towards him. Taking advantage of Sha letting his guard down, the bandit attempts to strike, but Xiao Pa intervenes and attacks the enemy with his powerful weapon. It seems that the bandit leader has a lot of resilience, and Sha warns that, although mortals possessed by the spirit of the god of war don't gain all of his power, this enemy should not be underestimated. The bandit unleashes a rock attack, and Sha creates a water curtain that easily breaks through. Then, Xiao Pa launches an attack with his powerful cannon arm, but the enemy manages to defend himself with a shield made of stones. He claims that as long as he has rocks around him, any attack will be in vain. However, he didn't anticipate that by touching the water, Sha could send an attack using a lightning technique, as we will see later on. To secure the final blow, Xiao Pa attacks with his mighty power cannon. In the end, they manage to defeat the enemy, and the spirit of Xu Tian is set free. Outside the cave, Jen, Sheng, and Ziju are found, and apparently their younger sister still had vital signs. At that moment, the trusted man of the bandit leader appears and engages in a sword fight with Jen. However, the enemy seems to deliver hard blows, leaving Jen trapped in a diamond barrier. To make matters worse, the enemy transforms Jen into a statue, but when all seems lost, the divine staff seems to awaken, and Sheng manages to break the diamond barrier and free his brother. The enemy manages to reclaim the staff, but it shrinks again. This causes the enemy to lower his guard, and Jen launches a lethal attack. The enemy is surprised by the speed of the attacks and seems to see a resemblance to another fighter. Once again, he lowers his guard. The demon insists, saying he sees a resemblance and claims that Jen was the heir of the double-bladed demon hunter. He recounts that ten years ago, that man ordered the capture of the double-bladed demon hunter, and at that time, he faced the hunter and was let go. And as he was about to reveal more about that mysterious man, that distinctive bell sound rings again, and the trusted man of the bandit leader dies, thus releasing the spirit of Xu Tian. At night, after everything that happened, inside the little white dragon ship, they try to heal Zi Yang's wounds. However, Sha says that his injuries have surpassed the healing limit of celestial magic. Despite this, he suggests another way to save Zi Yang, sealing his spirit, finding the god, and asking him to heal his wounds. But for that, the girl must leave her current body and be resurrected in another body. Ziju agrees, and Sha seals her sister's spirit in the amulet she wears. Everyone feels distressed, thinking they could have done more to prevent what happened. However, a new dawn invites these heroes to continue their adventure, also adding a new member, at least by Jen's decision. We can see our adventurous friends arriving with the ship, Little White Dragon, in a new city. We notice that Sheng is affected by fever, and they ask Sha if he knows any spell to reduce the fever. He responds that Sheng should not worry, because the cause of his discomfort is linked to the fact that the Divine Staff has absorbed two fragments of Xu Tian's spirit at the same time. This creates a certain burden on the owner's spirit, and since the young man is mortal, he needs a period of time to adapt. So, upon reaching the Earth God's store, he will take a special medicine, and will clearly be much better. After this, Ziju leaves the ship in light clothing due to the heat. Upon seeing her attractive figure, Xiao gets very angry, and asks her if she has no shame in dressing like that, to which the woman responds that she only took off her jacket because of the heat. After exploring the city a bit more, Zi notices that Xiao Pa is still angry, so he suggests her to also take off her jacket to cool down. Finally, they reach their destination, which is the Gui Zhen store. Zi seems disappointed because instead of resembling a store of the god of the earth, it looks more like a clothing store, raising doubts about whether they will really have medicine for his brother. 
Xiao Pa calls him an idiot and asks him to examine the letters of Gui to see what they form, so they decide to enter to check it. Xiao calls the store manager, who turns out to be a rather strange old man. This guy tries to sell them clothes until he finally realizes that they are two celestials, but the old man gets distracted by the presence of Ziju and tries to show her a special bikini for her figure. This angers Xiao Pa who punches him. In a serious tone, the old man explains the reason for the change in products in his store, which is related to the chaos that arose in the world since the demons won the war. Fewer and fewer celestial customers visited his business, so he had to sell those mortal products to survive all this time. After interacting with a figure on the table, the room changes completely, taking the form they expected to see in a store of the god of the earth. Without waiting a second, Xiao asks the old man for some celestial beans and quickly gives them to Sheng to relieve his pain, as these beans have the power to alleviate magic overload. After this, the old man was asked why, after so many years of being closed, the industrial furnace of Fire City had been reignited. He began to tell a story in which, 100 years ago, a huge fire meteorite fell from the sky and landed in the closed industrial furnace. Since then, the weather has started to change in a very strange way, making every day for those 100 years feel like summer. That massive meteorite burned for 300 days before cooling down, now becoming the new industrial furnace of Fire City. Additionally, he explains that the furnace cannot be shut down as the entire city's energy depends on it. However, it is now controlled by a demonic force called the Great Flame, and its leader, Huo Shi Yun, is the true ruler of Fire City. After hearing these words, Xiao becomes angry as he doesn't understand how, being a celestial being, he can obey a demon. He explains that Huo Shi Yun is a high-ranking demon who can control flames, and he doesn't dare to defy him. Then Xia asks Sheng if he is feeling better and requests him to take out the divine staff and spin it. The boy complies with the orders, and as he begins to spin it, the staff emits waves that trigger a reaction from the meteorite. They realize that a fragment of the God of War's spirit is where the meteorite fell. They deduce that the power of fire is manifesting within the demon. The silence is interrupted when Sheng drops the staff to the ground because the pendant broke. After this, they decide to go after the fragment, warning the brothers that this time they will face a high-ranking demon with a quite powerful magical ability which has nothing to do with the human demons they fought before. Jen seems to care little about this, and asks Ziju to take care of Xiao Sheng, although the little one doesn't like the idea and also wants to go. Meanwhile, inside one of the facilities, we observe what appears to be the secretary of the organization's leader. She reports that the core is still secure, and upon receiving this information, the man comments that the main function is about to begin. Meanwhile, our protagonists reach the entrance of the Great Flame's lair. According to the blueprints, what they seek is at the top of the building. Zi Ju is taking care of Sheng, who still has a high fever and seems to be having nightmares. In the young man's dream, the two absorbed fragments transform into two spirits who narrate the legend of the God of War facing demons and being betrayed. The presence of their former carriers tries to tempt the boy to use the power of the God of War's spirit and replace who he is with someone stronger sacrificing his soul. After reflecting, he realizes that he could indeed become stronger, but he does not desire power to be superior to others. Rather, he seeks it to protect those he cares about. So if the condition for obtaining that power is to lose his soul and become an evil being, then he doesn't need that power. After uttering these words, the divine staff reacts, as he has just passed the test of temptation. Now his heart will strengthen, and his spirits will be more united. Back in the lair of the Great Flame, our heroes enter, leaving behind piles of defeated men until they reach the main hall. At that moment, someone appears on the stairs and claims that the actors have finally arrived, except for Jen, to whom he says that he is not the actor of this play and that this does not concern him. When Jen attempts to attack, the leader throws a fireball to push him away and informs them that he has been waiting for 100 years to receive the two Celestials as the audience of the revenge play has been waiting for him for a long time. This bewilders those present, and as he descends step by step, he envelops himself in an intense aura of fire, initiating the main play called The Burning Inferno. After this, Huo Shi Yun informs them that he is aware they are seeking the fragment of the divine spirit residing within him, and challenges them, daring them to take it for themselves. 
Jen dispenses with formalities and without a moment's hesitation, lunges at the man with the intent to attack. However, the demon creates a barrier of fire that blocks the assault. After demonstrating that he hasn't suffered a single scratch, he decides to counterattack with much greater force, effortlessly defeating Jen. Quickly, Sha uses an ice spell to lower the temperature of the conflict. She then informs Yun that the fire meteorite has not completely cooled down and that the fire in his body could activate its energy, causing a disaster in the city. She asks him to give up the divine spirit so they can completely cool the meteorite. However, the knight responds that he only needs a bit of blood from those who are immortal. This prompts a reaction from Sha, who realizes the man's intentions are to unleash the forbidden technique of the fire meteorite, intending to direct it as an act of revenge towards the celestial palace of the immortals in space. Upon hearing this, Xiao Pa decides to attack by firing his enormous cannon. Unfortunately, this proves ineffective as the demon counterattacks, destroying the celestial cannon. Jen recovers and mentions that, even though he doesn't understand what the forbidden technique of the fire meteorite is, he cannot allow them to be sacrificed, and the demon to achieve his goal with spilled blood. Finally, he decides to confront him and asks them to go talk to the elder in the store to devise a plan. Meanwhile, the city's inhabitants begin to notice strange tremors and witness the industrial furnace spewing flames from the top. The old man claims that the fire furnace has been reactivated and believes it was because the Celestials angered the terrible creature. Inside the lair, the battle rages on. Huo Shi Yun launches his fire attacks, and Jen, to distract him, throws one of his sabers. The demon easily dodges it, but from behind, our lad manages to reach him with his other saber, splitting him in half and turning him to ashes. What Jen didn't expect was to be caught by the fire whip and slammed to the ground. The demon reproaches him for not having to sacrifice his life to protect those cowardly celestials who showed no remorse when they abandoned him. However, Jen seems to care little about what he says. After a couple of attempts at punches, all dodged by the man, the demon takes a quick step forward and delivers a powerful punch to the stomach, making him hit a wall and fall weakly to the ground. The demon is surprised that Jen has resisted so much, so he considers that he deserves a dignified funeral in flames. He launches a powerful fire attack, but at that moment Sha Luo and Xiao Pa appear, creating an ice wall that stops the flames. Due to the high temperature, the wall begins to melt, so Sha tells her companion to take Jen. At that moment, she opens a small wound on her neck, bleeding, but pays no attention to it, as her goal is to rescue her friends. They disappear from the place amid dust and vapor. The demon realizes that there are a couple of drops of blood on the ground and decides to proceed with his plan. After drawing some symbols on the ground, a magical pentagram is created, and the furnace starts operating, activating the fire meteorite, which begins to float automatically. Unable to do anything, the celestial messengers believe that the celestial palace is not in danger, as the forbidden technique is being used in the opposite direction. However, it is likely to disintegrate due to overheating. The downside is that the meteorite may end up falling back onto the city. While the demon is surprised that the plan is not going as expected, the messengers decide to consult the old man for a solution. Meanwhile, the city is ablaze, and the enraged demon threatens to exterminate all immortals. The citizens rush to take refuge in the shelter. Once everyone is in place, they wonder how the demon could control the meteorite's energy for 100 years, and the old man says that the only treasure in the mortal world capable of withstanding a catastrophic fire spell is the coolant core of the industrial furnace in the City of Fire. Despite being a sage of the land and supposed to recognize all magical and divine objects in his area, the old man cannot detect the presence of this core due to a barrier that the demons have placed in the underground of the fortress. To access the fortress's underground and obtain the coolant, they will alert the demon as the fortress is heavily guarded. The old man suggests going stealthily and stealing it without being seen. At that moment, all eyes turn to Zi Ju, known for being a skilled thief. Sheng explains that the woman swore never to steal again, and because she broke her oath, she lost her younger sister. He cannot allow the woman to do it, but the old man says he doesn't have to worry because the destiny oath can only be fulfilled once. Furthermore, the coolant core is an immortal treasure, and recovering it cannot be considered theft. She agrees to do it and infiltrates through the ventilation ducts of the lair, attacking the distracted guards. She then goes after the female secretary with whom she fights and subdues her by tying her hands and feet. 
She manages to extract the access code to the basement treasure. Back in the shelter, the demon attacks the city, and if they don't stop him, the place will collapse. Xiao Pa decides to confront him to give Ziju time, and Sha also joins the battle. Meanwhile, Ziju finally reaches a large dark room. After inspecting the place, she decides to advance toward the divine machine in front of her, and taking a couple of steps triggers the motion sensor that activates the security system. A large protective robot appears from the ceiling, and the woman reacts quickly to dodge it. The city is plunged into chaos, and people are seeking refuge. Huo Shi Yun seems to recall an incident from the past in which a red-haired woman was traveling by train through the city. He observes a thief stealing another passenger's wallet, and decides to intervene at that moment. The thief attempts to attack her with a knife, but Zi Yun immobilizes him. After stopping the thief, he asks the girl if she's okay, and she responds affirmatively, quite blushingly. This is the first encounter of what will become a beautiful marriage. Later on the news, they report that the demon king has unleashed his army to invade the kingdom after a thousand years of peace. All the gods are coming together to fight this war. The woman is frightened, and the man embraces her to comfort her. He assures her that the city will not be a battleground, as the fire demon clan and the deity clan have a peace agreement, and the celestial realm will protect them. Sometime later, a meteor shower strikes the city, causing havoc. The alarm warns all citizens to run for shelter. While Zi Yun talks on the phone with his wife, worried, he asks her to wait for him in the shelter. Unfortunately, one of the meteors hits where his wife is, and we already know the outcome. Back in the present, celestial messengers confront the demon in an intense battle. The demon's resentment towards the immortals is clearly visible as he launches a fire attack at them, but Xiao Luo blocks it with an ice barrier. Suddenly, Sheng's golden staff falls from the sky, creating a protective dome around his friends. The boy appears and asks the demon to stop, as there are innocent people in the city suffering because of him. At that moment, the demon reacts and realizes he is causing harm to innocent people, but remembers that he lost what he loved most because of the gods. He tells the boy to ask his hypocritical immortal friends what really happened. Xiao Luo recounts that when the demon king tried to destroy the palace with the fire meteor, they created a protective field with the power of the gods to protect the place. This changed the strength and trajectory of the meteor towards the mortal world. Luo regrets what happened, but there was no other option. The demon responds that if he kills them now and then asks for forgiveness, will he be forgiven? He then launches his attack towards the girl, and Sheng reacts with the power of the staff, creating a protective barrier over her. Sheng warns the creature that its hatred will only bring tragedy to the city, and suggests that it could use its power to save the people living there. However, these words only cause the demon, driven by its thirst for revenge, to transform into a massive wolf-like beast, swearing revenge in honor of his wife's spirit. He then delivers a powerful punch to Sheng. Although Sheng blocks the blow with his staff, he is sent flying through the air due to the impact. Ziju appears to have defeated the guardian robot and is heading towards the artifact. She attempts to grab it with her webs, but they freeze upon contact with the coolant. Then, a wave emanates from the device, and the demon god Bo Yi appears, seizing the small magic stone. Back in the city, we see that Sheng has survived the blow by using his staff to lean against the building and his protective shield to mitigate the impact. However, he falls to his knees from exhaustion. The beast explains that using the war god's soul fragment consumes a tremendous amount of energy. Despite the creature's suggestion to surrender, Sheng ignores those words and leaning on his staff, stands up. This angers the creature, which is about to launch a large fireball, but stops upon sensing a wave of energy from the cooling core. The demon decides to launch a gigantic fireball, creating a massive explosion, and departs from the scene. Although the attack did not hit our protagonists, Xiao Pa is injured. Now Ziju is unprotected, and Sheng decides to go and protect her. Sha, using the little energy left, leads Sheng to the location, and the boy promises to bring the woman to safety. Later, the demon appears transformed into a beast and faces Bo Yi. The power emanating from both villains makes the place tremble. Bo Yi reveals that what he really came to seek is inside Zi Yun, and transforms into a huge minotaur with white fur. He slams the wolf against the ceiling, and before it can touch the ground he approaches and pierces its chest, removing the war god fragment from within, and storing it in a box next to the cooling core. Bo Yi watches as the large meteorite is about to fall on the city. 
In his distraction, Sheng appears, breaking the box with his staff, and upon contact with the god fragment, we see how he absorbs it, giving him much more power. The demon realizes and attacks Sheng with an axe. The child is saved by Ziju, who lunges at him to prevent the blow. The demon assumes that the staff is still controlled by the child, decides to cut off his arm to avoid being consumed by the weapon, and after taking out a small coin-shaped artifact, tells him that he will come for the cooling core next time and dis- In the distance, the mysterious character emerges. Jen decides to investigate, but this individual doesn't respond to any of his questions. He notices the twin swords that belong to Qi Tian, and recalls a fight against that warrior. The mysterious character asks if Jen is Qi Tian's son, and Jen replies that his father entrusted him with those swords, and that his name is Yuan Xin. This being mentions that the scar on his face was caused by the world's most powerful demon hunter, and only Qi Tian's successor deserves to wield those swords. Just as they are about to face off to prove whether Jen is worthy of using those swords, celestial messengers appear. Xiao Pa warns him not to seek trouble, but seeing that the being does not respond, Xiao Pa asks if he is listening. Without a word, the mysterious figure attacks at great speed. If Xia does not react in time, Xiao Pa could be split in two. The stranger challenges Jen to fight again, but Ziju appears and introduces the enemy as Wu Chang Gui, known to be the strongest swordsman of the Ghost Clan. She mentions that it would be an unfair fight since Jen is injured. Wu Chang decides to wait until noon for Jen to recover, sealing the place so that no one can escape. Additionally, he warns that if Jen does not appear to fight, everyone will die. Once inside the ship, the silence reflected the nerves, and Ziju was asked what she knew about this swordsman. The girl recounted the warrior's story and mentioned that, according to all the legends she had heard, he was practically an invincible being. However, Jen pointed out that this being was not invincible, as he had once been defeated by Qi Tian with those same dual sabers. He trusted what his father had told him. The key lay in those two sabers forged with a mysterious iron that hides an unknown power, and he had the blood of the demon hunter. He was confident in being able to unleash the true power. Despite all predictions, Jen decided to face the situation, just like his father, who fought against demons until his last moments of life, and fulfill his promise to take care of his little brother. That night, everyone was worried, but the fight was inevitable, and Jen had to take advantage of the time for his recovery. After this, the day of the encounter finally arrived. Since his friends couldn't persuade him, they at least offered their support by giving him a kind of magical armor and a speed spell that would allow him to fully exploit his combat abilities. Despite Sheng's attempts to stop him one last time, his older brother explained to him that facing obstacles, no matter how difficult, was what gave meaning to life. So, under no circumstances, could he escape from something that kept him alive. Jen, from a young age, had wished to inherit his father's swords. However, to achieve this, he had to work very hard. In the present, these warriors began their confrontation. Jun attacked at great speed, but despite this, Wu Changgui was able to predict his movements and land a few blows that the boy's armor could withstand thanks to the gift from Ziju. To make matters worse, Wu Chang had the advantage due to the length of his sword, accurately striking with the reach of his attacks. Something similar had been trained with his father since childhood, as he knew that was one of the weaknesses of the technique he employed. Thanks to this training, he was able to turn the situation around and even initiate a much more evenly matched battle in which both seemed to predict each other's every move. Wu Chang Gui seemed to begin to respect him, telling him that from now on, he would fight with all his might, and employing the legendary technique of the phantom sword that completely shattered Jen's armor. Our warrior was cornered, assuming that the opponent was too strong and maybe he couldn't defeat him, but he remembered the last technique he learned in his tough training, the blood sacrifice technique. This granted him much more power. However, using it meant losing practically his humanity. Even his father warned him not to use it under any circumstances. With no other option, he resorted to this technique, using his blood to unleash the power of the swords, which, thanks to the evil energy of hundreds of demons, granted him unparalleled power. With this power, they began to fight on an equal footing, where it's evident that Jen delivers a solid blow. Wu Changgui started to get excited at finding a worthy opponent, and despite receiving more attacks, he kept getting back up. However, due to all the blows he continued to accumulate, he gradually lost control of his power, and in the eyes of his friends, he only repeated, I'm going to kill you, 
making it clear that he no longer controlled his inner self. The true battle begins from this moment, and we see Jen with a fiery gaze as he observes his enemy from the riverbank. Our protagonist launches the first attack, which is evaded by Wu Chang Gui, and then swiftly follows up with a second attack. This surprises Wu Chang, who is impressed by the demon hunter's skills, but notices something strange about Jen. Suddenly he approaches his friends with his head down and without uttering a word. This bewilders the others as they wonder what is happening to him. They realize he has lost control and starts attacking them. This was the danger of using the blood sacrifice technique. Now, he views everyone as enemies and begins to attack. In the first attempt, Shung stops him with his divine staff. Then Jen resumes attacking indiscriminately, and when he is about to strike Ziju, Sha manages to slam him against some rocks and freezes his body to restrain him. Worried, Sheng approaches to check on his brother. Jen breaks free from the ice and resumes attacking, threatening to kill them all. Wu Changgui reappears and stabs Jen, causing him to fall unconscious. At that moment, he has a vision alongside the twin swords, which tell him that he can still fight. Therefore, he asks them to grant him their power. When he tries to take them, he sees in his vision his father walking through a village with Qi Tian. As they traverse the place, they realize that everyone is suffering due to plagues, ghosts, and demons. A badly injured elderly man approaches and thanks them for coming to the place. Qi Tian embraces him and responds that he regrets being late. Then a child comes running, warning everyone that the demons have arrived to devour them. When the demons appear, one of them tries to attack Qi Tian, but he eliminates it instantly. They surround the owner of the twin swords but are easily defeated. After this, he heads towards the cave of a nearby mountain, where he sees demon children crying. An elderly man appears behind him, begging him not to harm the children, and bowing before him, saying that the children are innocent. Soon, Yuan Shin appears, reminding him of his mission to kill the demons. But Qi Tian responds that he simply cannot do it because he does not want to massacre other races for humans to survive. Yuan believes that they need to eliminate the demons to make the world a better place. But Qi Tian disagrees, and states that endless killings will not change the world's purgatory. Then he tells his brother that he will go west, thinking that he will find a way to end it all, but he promises to return. After this, we see Qi Tian arriving in a city filled with demon corpses. He inspects one of the bodies and discovers that the attacker used a deadly sword technique. He investigates a building where he encounters Wu Chang Gui, who has just finished killing demons. Wu Chang Gui can sense the souls of all the demons Qi Tian has killed, and claims to be a demon hunter capable of killing a god. Assuming he must be the strongest human in the world, he challenges him to a fight. Sometime later, we see Yuan Xin leading a group of humans during winter, taking refuge in a cave. As he looks out on the horizon, he senses a man approaching, and realizes it's Qi Tian holding a baby. Yuan Xin offers to take care of the child, and Qi Tian says that the fate of the world will depend on him, hinting that he is unwell. Qi Tian announces that chaos is imminent and hands his swords to Yuan, telling him that he doesn't have much time left, so they must entrust the future to the children. Jen regains consciousness while lying in the healing river, observed by Wu Changgui. Immediately, he removes the sword from Jen's shoulder and starts to move away. Jen rises to continue the fight, but Wu Chang tells him, a life for a life. As in the past, it was the law of the strong over the weak. So, he's merely returning the favor, but next time, there will be no mercy. This annoys Jen, but the demon points his long sword at him, saying he owes him a real fight. When Jen becomes a demon hunter worthy of that sword, they will face each other again, and Wu Chang withdraws from the scene. After this, his friends are relieved that everything turned out well, and Sheng runs to embrace his brother, tears streaming down his face. He then reveals that he had a dream, the dream of the world's first demon hunter, and that a fragment of memory remains in the twin swords. Sheng wonders if his staff is also connected to Qi Tian, but Jen says they need to gather fragments from all souls to uncover the answers. They return aboard the little white dragon ship, and Sheng mentions there's so much to search for, yet he doesn't know what he's looking for. They also need to collect soul fragments and learn about the secrets behind the twin swords. Xiao brings up a sacred place where they can find all the answers, Feng Kun. While Jen and Xiao Pa playfully argue like children, Sha Luo mentions that it's the only city where immortals reside in this realm, and its civilization is incredibly advanced. This excites the brothers so their next stop will be in that sacred city, despite Xiao Pa's objections.
In an opulent palace, we observe a young master named Tian Yu in the company of his butler, Uncle Fu. The latter introduces them to the candidate, Princess Salamadora from the city of Persia, hoping that she will become Tian Yu's bride. Fu informs Tian Yu that the princess is skilled in dance. Despite her efforts to impress Tian Yu, he appears uninterested. Then, the butler requests the candidate to leave, and she departs in tears. Uncle Fu worries about not finding a candidate who will capture Tian Yu's heart, but he is confident that he has an ace up his sleeve. He introduces the next candidate, Xian Luo, the maiden of beauty. Tian Yu seems bored, but when Fu mentions Xian Luo, the young man shows interest. Everything seems to be going well until Xian Luo reveals her face, leaving Tian Yu stunned. As she approaches to flirt, the young man flees in horror. Later in the garden, while Tian Yu recovers from the traumatic experience, he remarks to Uncle Fu that he has terrible taste in choosing women. However, he reveals that he is already in love, and it's with our celestial messenger, Xiao. It turns out they made a promise to marry when she returns. The butler promises to prepare a wedding for them upon her return. Meanwhile, on the Little White Dragon spacecraft, Xiao Pa is behaving strangely, and his celestial companion begins to notice. They are about to reach the city when Xia asks her companion if she is interested in going to that place. She responds that it might be a waste of time because they may not find the help they need. Xia comments that he believes Emperor Chong must have a lot of information and that there is still a fragment of soul there. At that moment, Sheng tells them that the staff is responding to a fragment of soul and points towards the city. Upon reaching the city entrance, they are surprised by its beauty. The guard stops them for a drone to scan them and then allows their entry. Suddenly, there is an announcement that Tian Yu will celebrate a grand wedding in three days, inviting everyone to attend the ceremony. Xiao Pa reveals her surprise with a euphoric shout, and all her friends look at her as she storms off angrily. While walking through the city, a fruit vendor tells them that her products are free to celebrate the wedding of the young master. Xiao Pa, with a crazed expression, asks her several questions, and his friends begin to notice the situation. At that moment, a group of soldiers arrives, welcoming them as distinguished guests and informing them that the young master is waiting for them at the palace. Everyone is surprised. In the venue, they are greeted with a grand banquet, and while the young ones are eating, the butler Fu announces that Tian Yu has arrived. He gives them a warm welcome. Ziju congratulates Tian Yu on his engagement and tells him that it was a surprise, so they couldn't prepare a gift for him. However, the young man claims that the greatest gift they could give him was safely escorting his girlfriend to the city. Upon discovering that the future wife is Xiao, everyone is bewildered. Chan Yu reveals that he registered her information in the security system, automatically triggering the wedding festival when she returned to the city, reminding her of the promise they made. We see little Xiao protecting Tian Yu from a group of thugs, whom she ends up beating badly. Tian Yu thanks little Xiao for saving him, saying that she is amazing and wishes for her to come to Feng Kun City when she is older because he wants her to be his girlfriend. She wonders what a girlfriend is. He explains, and after a brief chat, she promises to be his girlfriend in the present. Tian Yu reveals that he has been waiting for her to return and is happy that they can now celebrate the wedding. However, she tells him that she didn't know what a girlfriend or love was because she was too young. At that moment, she reveals that she arranged everything with the thugs because she wanted him to owe her a debt and pay for her meal. The young man seems not to care about what she says. Those details don't matter to him because she has already made a promise and fulfilled it by coming to the city. Xiao actually doesn't want to get married, but Xia thinks they could use the wedding as an excuse to meet the emperor and find the fragments, so she decides to play along. Then, the butler directs the guests to their rooms so they can settle in. Later, the team gathers again, but this time without Xiao, to search for information about the fragment in the city. Ziju asks if Xiao will stay in the city to get married, but everyone thinks it's impossible. Suddenly, the divine staff responds to a fragment, giving them a clue about its location. Then, we see Tian Yu in his room and learn that he is the possessor of the soul fragment, vowing never to let it go again. In the city center, Jen and Ziju are having a few drinks when the boy gets distracted by a girl. Ziju mentions that a thief has also set his sights on him, and at that moment, they discover that his necklace has been stolen. Jen tries to intervene to catch the culprit, and as he begins to lecture him, the thief manages to escape. The affected woman appears with soldiers, and it turns out that our hero was wearing the mentioned stolen necklace. 
Jen tries to convince them that he is not the thief, pointing out that they are guests of the prince. The guards check the information, but the documents indicate that they are illegal immigrants. They attempt to arrest them, and the two make a run for it. On the other hand, Sha and Sheng search for fragments all over the city. Suddenly, the Divine Staff marks a signal for them coming from outside Feng Kun. However, when they reach the location, the signal disappears again. While attempting to return to the city, they hear an announcement stating that all city gates will be closed for security reasons, and no one will enter or leave. Trying to enter, a barrier makes all efforts futile, and anyone attempting to force entry will be considered an illegal invasion. Out of nowhere, an old man appears who seems to be a resident of the city, and went out to buy medicine for his daughter. Sheng tries to speak with the guards about the old man's situation, but they respond that they must respect the given order. Our heroes try everything to enter, but even their powers seem to fail against this. The old man mentions that there is another way to enter, and explains that when the city was built, the craftsman constructed an underground tunnel. When he was young and playing outside, he found a strange entrance, and perhaps that is the entrance to the secret tunnel. Upon reaching the vicinity of the entrance, he remembers that it was exactly the same as when he had found it in his youth. Sheng tries to inspect this entrance, and upon touching it with his hands, it opens its doors. Everyone decides to descend, and finds that the place is in good condition. The boy seems to discover a secret passage, and in trying to cross it, he collides with a magical barrier. Shaw says that the barrier belongs to the immortal clan, and tries to enter, claiming to be a celestial messenger. Many symbols adorn the walls, and in attempting to find a mechanism, a sharp object injures his hand. With the blood from his wound, the barrier finally opens, allowing everyone to enter. Ultimately, they find an entrance leading to the center of the city. Upon reaching the light of the exit, they find themselves in the middle of a setting that belongs to a bar. The kids try to blend in, but the woman who was dancing is about to report them to one of the guards, who then pursues them. To make matters worse, their faces now appear on posters throughout the city, urging citizens to report these two suspects to the guards, as they are illegal immigrants. Our friends, now fugitives, suspect that the old man has something to do with what has happened, and that it may all be part of a plan. On the other hand, Xiao was wearing her wedding dress, and the butler accompanied her to where Tianyu was for a photo shoot. She tried to cooperate with the photos, but her face didn't match the moment. The photographer asked her to smile, and for the couple to get closer for the photo. When Tianyu approached to give her a kiss, she gave him a stomp, and asked if he knew he lied. So why was he marrying her? He whispered in her ear, Do you know why you were bullied in school? He recounted how she was always the center of attention, and he couldn't do enough to get her attention. Then, he was with the guys sitting on a sports field, and one of them told him he would help him learn everything about Xiao. So he told them that if they helped, he would pay for their meals every day. Then we see the guy start to bully him, and she appears to help the beaten guy. She is surprised and tells him that he did all that to buy her ice cream and make her marry him. She confesses to him that she is in town not to fulfill her promise to marry him, but has come to look for the fragment. He says she used the marriage excuse as a tactic, and with tears in his eyes, hugs her. The photographer, who was still on the scene, takes a perfect photograph that becomes visible throughout the city, where the whole town gathers to celebrate. Her friends believe that Xiao Pa is in danger at this moment, deducing that everything that happened to them was organized by Tianyu, and Jen and Ziju, who were hidden, come to the same conclusion. Meanwhile, during the photo shoot, Xiao Pa, as usual, is shouting at the photographer to delete the photos. The young man in love tells her to calm down, that it's a good photo, and when Xiao turns around, it seems as if she has been hypnotized. Young Tianyu takes advantage of this to use the fragment to convince her, and then asks her to forgive him in a whisper. Everyone in the city is eagerly awaiting the wedding of Miss Xiao Pa and young Tianyu. The giant screen announces that the ceremony will take place in the main hall, inviting all representatives of the Feng Kun sex in the city to attend the banquet. Meanwhile, Jen and Ziju watch anxiously, looking for the right moment to sneak into the palace and save their friend. In the distance, two men are sitting, having coffee, and it's noticeable that they have two wedding invitations on the table. At that moment, Ziju approaches and tries to seduce the men, asking if she can sit with them. While the men are distracted by the lady's charm, 
Ju throws a net with her ring and grabs the invitations, hooking them onto a rope on the ground. A few meters away, Jen is sitting at another table, and at the right moment, pulls the cards towards his side of the table. Meanwhile, the men argue about who will invite Ziju to the ceremony. When they finally turn around, they discover that the girl is gone, as well as the invitations. As they walk away, she recommends to Jen to think about how he will enter with the two swords he carries. He replies that he will say he is an elegant and powerful arms dealer who has killed 108 demons, and that the swords are made from the blood of beasts. Then, he will present them as a wedding gift to Master Tianyu. If everything goes according to plan, she will claim to be the wife of a businessman, a village girl who simply wants to see the world. Meanwhile, Sha and Shang are in prison. They tell the guards that they are friends of the young master's fiancé and want to attend the wedding. When the soldiers are about to close the cells, Sha stops them, claiming to be the personal nurse of the bride, Xiao Pa, who suffers from a strange disease that requires spell treatment. He warns that if it is not treated, it could ruin the wedding. Later, one of the soldiers tells their leader that he saw them with the future real bride when they entered the city. The leader of the soldiers informs Tianyu of everything and goes to the prison to talk to the protagonists. He asks them why they have come to die here when he offered them the opportunity to stay outside the city. Furthermore, he warns them that once the friend becomes his wife, she will stay in the city of Feng Kun forever. Sheng reveals that Xiao Pa did not agree with the wedding and that they only came in search of the fragment. At that moment, the divine staff reacts to the fragment carried by Tianyu. The boy attempts to attack, but the master swiftly dodges the strike and delivers a blow that leaves him unconscious on the ground. Sha decides to attack as well, but Xiao Pa's fiancé manages to dodge the strike and retaliates with a blow to the stomach. With the power of the fragment, he traps the protagonists. The blonde-haired youth tries to steal Sheng's soul and consciousness, but a voice questions who dares to enter its territory. Sheng takes Tian Yu's hand and begins to absorb his power, while the voice murmurs that the body of this mortal belongs to it. Sheng's eyes turn as red as blood. Confused by what has transpired, the prince decides to leave the scene, leaving Sha to fight in his place. The celestial messenger delivers a solid blow, catching the child off guard. From the ground, he pleads for Sha to react, but it is clear that Sha is being manipulated by the prince. The child decides to defend himself against the attacks, and charges at his friend with all his strength, leaving him unconscious on the ground. At this point, the child doesn't know what to do as he can't communicate with his friends and now must fend for himself. Moreover, he assumes he is no match for the prince. In this moment of uncertainty, a voice begins to speak. This voice asks what he fears, and the child wonders who is speaking. The voice introduces itself as a realm of consciousness or a cage of power where it contains a force even more powerful than the god of the celestial battle. It tells him that the celestial staff contains all the power Sheng could ever possess. The mysterious voice asks if he has forgotten who he is, but the child responds that he is not a monster. He takes the divine staff and decides to attack this unknown voice. Later we see him falling, clinging to the powerful weapon, and after a dazzling light, he reappears in the cell with his divine staff. Quickly, Sheng observes his friend lying on the floor and decides to call the guards for help, claiming that the body has been cursed by demons and that if he dies, the body will explode, destroying the entire cell. The guard decides to inspect, and the child attacks him from behind. Before leaving the cell, Sheng promises to return to rescue the Divine Messenger. While trying to rescue Xiao Pa, he realizes that the place has no way out. Someone locked in the cell tells him that he won't be able to leave without help and that if he opens the cell, he will guide him to the exit. This man turns out to be the sacred emperor Chong, who had been imprisoned by his own son to rule the city. Finally, the emperor has been freed, and they will rescue their friends and expose Tian Yu. While trying to sneak through the palace, they were detected by the guards. Just as they were about to be captured, a smoke bomb obscured the guards' vision, and Zhen and Ziju appeared, attacking all the soldiers. Following this, Sheng introduces the man to his friends. Jen decides to show him the swords to see if he recognizes them, and reveals that they are different from the originals he knows. Then Jen apologizes and asserts that this man is the true Emperor Chong, and they have many questions to ask him, but first, they must rescue Xiao Pa. Meanwhile, 
Ziju senses that something is amiss, but ultimately, they decide to begin the rescue operation. All the guests gather at the palace for the wedding, our protagonists also attend, and have changed their appearance to go unnoticed. The butler welcomes everyone, while our present friends do not perceive any signs of Sha Luo's presence, until F.A. the butler, introduces the representative of the immortal world, clearly under Tianyu's control. Everything could be easier if Emperor Chong revealed the truth to everyone present and had his officials apprehend his son. However, Chong claims that the army is under control due to Tianyu's magic, and that it is not convenient to rush. He suggests that Jun fights Tianyu in a duel for honor, as, by tradition in the city of Feng Kun, the prince must accept the challenge. After the duel, the emperor will reveal his identity, and they can thus save their friends. The ceremony is about to begin, and as the marriage vows are about to be exchanged, Jen appears in the crowd and challenges the prince. The crowd goes wild, and the butler says that the duel will take place, with the winner getting the bride. Both fighters head to the battlefield, and Jen delivers the first blow. The prince manages to block the attack, unleashing cheers among the citizens watching the fight. Meanwhile, Ziju tries to reach where Sha is seated. However, when attempting to speak with him, the celestial message seems to receive no response. Unable to find a solution, Ziju begins to slap him. The prince realizes the girl's intentions and orders our celestial messenger to attack. Returning to the fight, Jen notices the prince is distracted and speaks to him to ensure he doesn't lose focus on the battle. Tianyu reacts with his spear, delivering several attacks to our hero. One of them causes a wound on Jen's shoulder. Meanwhile, Sheng and Emperor Chong manage to reach the spot where Xiao is. They discover that she too is under the control of the prince. To make matters worse, the cut on Jen's shoulder causes his blood to slowly freeze. However, our hero is not willing to be defeated so easily. His fighter's pride drives him to stand up again, emitting enormous power that propels him to confront the prince and manage to injure him with cuts. The latter is not willing to back down, and thus begins the real battle, unleashing a powerful force in his attacks that generates an immense accumulation of energy. Both are injured, and Sheng decides to intervene to reveal the truth to all citizens. He exposes the deceitful actions of his prince, and the emperor steps forward to address everyone. The citizens are astonished by this revelation, and express their support for the emperor. When Chong orders the soldiers to capture his son, he launches an attack that freezes the entire place, including those present. As the prince looks up, he sees his fiancée Xiao Pa, frozen. The only one who has not suffered harm from the attack is our fighter friend Jen, who delivers a blow to the prince's leg. However, the prince retaliates with his spear, injuring Jen in the back. Jen declares that he will kill him to keep the city safe. Suddenly Chong stands up, and a demon emerges from within him, greeting the young prince. He reveals that father and son did everything possible to prevent the demon from obtaining the fragment of the celestial soul. Even when the demon Hu Zhao took control of the emperor's body, they agreed to lock him deep in a dungeon and sealed the place with immortal magic to prevent the demon from escaping. They entrusted Tianyu with the responsibility of guarding the city. The young prince decides to fulfill the promise he made to his father to take care of the citizens of Feng Kun. When he is about to attack the demon Hu Zhao, Jen stops him with her sword and angrily reveals that she was the one who killed his father, Yuan Xin. The demon seems to enjoy this moment when both young people are angry and decides to provoke them. Jen reacts by trying to launch an attack with her sword, but the demon decides to manipulate Sheng's body and place it in front of her, using it as a shield. He begins to use Sheng as a puppet, making the child attack his brother with his divine staff. While the demon Hu Zhao was distracted, the prince tries to attack from behind, but he manages to evade the attack without a problem. He then takes out the famous bell, and upon ringing it, the old man from the city entrance appears. Finally, he reveals his true identity. He turns out to be the monster that kills demon hunters, the one Yuan Xin fought that time while his sons were present, the infamous demon Asura. He attacks the boys on the battlefield, and finally they decide to join forces to fight together. The young warriors take the initiative and attack the demon Asura, but it seems unaffected as the attacks cause no harm. The prince then decides to place the fragment of the celestial soul on his spear, and they ambush the demon, causing some damage. Meanwhile, Hu Zhao asks Sheng if his older brother told him how their father died. Then she says she will show him how it happened. 
When the demon Asura is about to attack the boys, he suddenly stops and decides to go directly for Xiao Pa. At that moment, the celestial messenger seems to react. And as the demon is about to execute his attack, the prince appears, piercing him with his spear, though Tian Yu is also injured by the demon's claws. The prince hands the celestial soul to Xiao Pa and collapses. This infuriates the young girl, who blindly attacks the demon Hu Zhao, but is protected by the protective shield of the Divine Staff's power. The demon claims that Sheng now belongs to him, and the boy tells his brother to escape and not worry about him. We see the demon Asura reacting to Hu Zhao's instructions. Jen decides it's the right time to use his blood sacrifice technique, and our hero, facing Asura, tries to battle the consciousness of the sword. This is perceived by the demon Zhao, who tries to destroy Jen's soul. At that moment, he enters our protagonist's memory, manipulating him with his recollection. Suddenly, the young man hears his father's voice calling him, saying that one day he will understand the true meaning of his twin swords and become the strongest demon hunter. We see the demon left surprised, and our protagonist begins to emanate tremendous powerful energy. When his sword slipped from his hands, Chi Tian appears taking the two twins. Jen asks him how to wield the true power of the twin swords, and he responds that the swords can kill demons and gods, but mortal bodies can also die. The true power does not lie in the sharp swords they carry. The true power of a demon hunter is the belief in protecting the people they love. At that moment, the demon Hu Zhao begins to despair and sends Asura to kill Jen. However, the demon falls to a swift sword attack, appearing behind Zhao and threatening her to release her younger brother, Sheng. Without realizing it, the demon controlling her brother signals Sheng to attack with his divine staff. The boy shouts at his brother to escape, but Hu Zhao is determined to have the boy kill his brother with his own hands, making him deliver some hard blows until he is badly injured on the ground. Just as she is about to deliver the final blow, Jen reacts and takes the boy, rendering him unable to move. The demon, seeing that these brothers do not want to be separated, suggests that they die together. He uses a technique known to demon hunters, the Five Finger Prison. Before the hand closes and they are locked inside, Jen throws his brother out of the prison, asking him not to lose against himself. The prison ends up closing with Jen inside. The enraged child speaks to his soul, asking what the price is for having great power. His soul replies that the power also belongs to him. After this, he frees himself from the demon's manipulation and unleashes all his inner power, drastically changing his appearance. The demon is astonished by what he sees. Just as he is about to mention his name, we see that the divine staff pierces through this being, telling him that he has no right to disrespect the king and that he should die by burning. The demon pleads for his life, but is quickly defeated without a trace. After this, the child collapses to the ground. Later, we see the emperor awaken, and upon looking up, he sees that everything has finally come to an end. Sometime later, the Emperor, along with our group of friends, bids farewell to the Prince. The scene is bleak for the inhabitants who mourn the loss. In the distance, Jen watches very frustrated by the situation, but they have finally avenged his father, assuming that the Prince paid the price. Later on we see our protagonist with the Emperor at the city gate. The wise Emperor tells Sheng to go to Mount Shumi, where he will find everything he wants to know, the land where the gods originated. However, he also warns them that demons and ghosts inhabit that place, where many guardians have fallen defeated. The divine messenger tells the emperor that after the war between gods and demons, the direct route to Mount Shumi no longer exists. The emperor tells them that he can take them, and a cross-border portal emerges from his hands. Before they take that route through the portal, the emperor tells Xiao that the city gates will always be open when he decides to return. Then, they board the little white dragon ship and set off on new adventures. In the season finale, we see a girl walking with her mother who finds the rattle of the demon Hu Zhao. She makes it sound, and on the girl's face, we can see a malicious smile. The end! Thanks for watching. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon to get new anime recaps.